All right, awesome. What's up, Dan? What's up, man? Thanks for having me. I appreciate you uh, inviting me on the show. Yeah, of course, man. Thank you for reaching out. I uh, posted in that group, and you were the, like one of the first ones to respond. So I yeah, think it's your a, it's been a good group. Your story, Dan, will be super inspiring to like, like you you weren't obese yourself, or maybe you were medically, but like just off the brink, right? But I think your story will be motivating to anybody who has a ton of weight to lose, and maybe it's like impacted their health, right? Because well, firstly, I want to get to a fun little fact about you, bro. You've had a beard. Like, I read through your website. You've had a beard for 10 years almost. Yeah, about about that, for sure. I <laughs> I started, I actually started having the beard, which is, like, part of my fitness story, I guess, when I had, so very quickly, I had, like, tons of injuries playing soccer growing up, and then that led to, like, a major surgery. That major surgery put me on my butt for 13 weeks. I couldn't put my left foot on the ground. I couldn't put any weight through it. And then during that time, it was like, you know, I couldn't even move. I could barely even go to the bathroom by myself. I just started growing my beard out and I had like super long hair at the time, obviously not anymore, but I had, uh, I just like, and then, uh, and then just kept it from there. And, and I did, I actually did like clean shave my face one time between then it was maybe like a year or two after I started and immediately it was like, no, this is, this is not happening. And, and I think that once you start having a beard, it's very hard to go back to a clean shaven face. I just felt like I looked like such a baby. Now the other side of it is that maybe it looks me, maybe it makes me look a little bit older, but I'm not all too concerned about that. Yeah, how old are you? Are you 28? I'm 28. That's right. Holy shit! Guess that. Let's go. <laughs> I think I'm pretty good at guessing ages. Amazing. I thought I thought you read that off the off my Instagram or something as well. That's awesome. No, that's a, no. that's a great guess. Wow. Yeah, usually I definitely get a little bit older, but I mean, whatever. I, again, not my concern. Yeah. It might help, actually, right? Having a like a clean shaven face. If someone thinks you're 19, they don't want a 19 year old coach, you know. That's right. It definitely it definitely helps with that little bit of notoriety. Looking older, it's like, oh, he must have been doing it longer, or you know, whatever. He's been in the trenches. A little bit, yeah, a little bit, a little bit more legit. That oh, he didn't just start this last week. So uh, yeah, it, it, I guess it helps. I don't know. Again, not something that I like really concern myself with yeah. all that much. And then you're from Canada, bro, right? That's right. Yeah. So I live uh, just outside Toronto. Um, in Vaughan, if anyone is familiar with like just uh, you know, Canadian or Toronto geography or whatever, but I'm like 40 minutes outside of downtown Toronto. And you've lived there your whole life? My whole life. There was a period of time uh, a couple of years ago where I was living right downtown, right in the in the thick of it. Probably also the worst two years in the history of Toronto to live downtown Toronto through COVID while everything was closed for forever. But uh, it is what it is, and I moved back out to the suburbs uh, since then. So I have like a couple clients that are Canadian. Do you, do you eat poutine a lot? Like very rarely. I mean, w once in a while, I guess. It's more of like a, a a drunk food, like after the bar kind of thing. Oh, really? If anything, or like if you're if you're if you happen to go into Montreal or to Quebec, that's where that's where they have like more poutine. But it's not like a it's not a common food. Most most places <laughs> like don't most restaurants and stuff don't have it unless it's like a a poutine place. But one of the few, you know late night foods that are like open late downtown is is a a chain or uh what's the word like a, a chain of restaurants called smokes right. poutinery and so that's that's like one one go-to for for that stuff but it's, it's been a while since i've had poutine it's also. just cheesy fries right yeah fries uh with cheese curds and gravy it's pretty good okay. <laughs> and then you know people get crazy and put all kinds of other stuff on it as well but like base the base of it is just fries cheese curds and gravy highly recommend you if, you've ever, if you've never had it like I mean, I should as a good Canadian boy, but I like not really. I we take French in school. We have to take French in school uh, up until grade nine, and so like I can get by. There's French words all around us. All the signs, all of our packaging has like English and French on it. Uh, so I definitely understand it. I wouldn't use it. I was in Montreal, which is predominantly French speaking. Like where I live, nobody speaks French, but right. I was in Montreal in the summer, and like you can, I can get by easily. Uh, you know, to be a tourist, to, to speak a little bit of French or understand things, but no, it's not something that I, that I use on a, on a regular basis. And then you played soccer growing up, no hockey. I did play hockey as well. Oh, um, nice, nice. I played a little bit of everything hockey, not uh, as much as, or just not as high of a level as soccer, but soccer was the thing that I enjoyed more and excelled at more. And so like, at some point there has to be a, like a choice and even just logistically, yeah. Like with my family, I've got two younger brothers as well who also both played sports. And like for my parents taking us around, we couldn't both be playing 
high level or all three of us couldn't be playing high level soccer, hockey, and, you know, swimming lessons and school basketball team and school volley. Like we couldn't do everything. So there had to be a, a choice and, and soccer was a thing for me. Yeah. You definitely got those athlete legs, man. Your legs are fucking jacked. <laughs> <laughs> I, saw I appreciate that man. story. Yeah. Got I appreciate some killer that. Quads. Thank you. It's, it's, uh, I mean, always a work in progress for, for forever, but it's something that I've worked at a lot. And like, I talk about, lower body training and squatting specifically so much because it was something that was like, I was told I was never going to be able to do that again, or I shouldn't do it anymore after all my knee injuries and stuff. And so I've worked really hard over the last, uh, whatever, eight or 10 years or so to like build that back up again and not injure my knees again and have strong legs and, and utilize that, utilize the ability to be able to squat because at one point I wasn't able to even like walk really. And, uh, and, and so being able to do that is something that I, I just, I take pride in and for all the other health benefits and having balanced legs, like, of course I love training upper body. Like, don't get me wrong. Like nothing better than a chest pump, but you know, it, we gotta, we don't have to excite men that much to train their upper body. It's just excite yeah. <laughs> training lower body. But I will say this, I'll, I'll add this and, and I would, and I'll be curious if anyone like disagrees with this, that I would say men train legs more often than women train upper body and of course massive generalization but i think yeah. women skip upper body day more than more than guys skip leg day yeah definitely i think that'd be a fair assumption uh before working yeah. with a coach right just on their own yeah. yeah 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 of course um what let's talk about that since you brought it up that's some, something i want to talk about what happened in 2014 like walk me through what happened yeah so so Prior to that, and maybe the like six or seven years prior to that, uh, and, you know, so it's my whole life, basically, I had a, a, a huge series of knee injuries where my patella or my kneecap would sublux, which means it pops out and pops back in. So it wasn't like a full dislocation where I had to go to the hospital to like get it pop back in, but it would just like jut out of place and, and come right back in. That yeah, was three, four months of an injury right there. And that happened, I don't know, eight to 10 times or something like that over the course of a number of years. Then I finally uh, got in touch with a surgeon who was able to work on me. It was very much discounted for a number of years. Oh, you're young. You'll grow out of it. Uh, you know, try this, try that, and there's nothing wrong with you. And you're not probably familiar with the the Canadian medical system, but you have to. You can't just show up to a surgeon's office and like pay for an appointment. You have to go through your family doctor and all this stuff. And so my family doctor was not to like you know kind of crap on doctors and stuff but in, or the system but like I had to convince my family doctor to give me a referral after so many times like this is not normal like I've I've been to all the physiotherapists or the physical therapists athletic therapy all these things and nothing's working like there's there's got to be something else here like let me just talk to a surgeon he's like after some time he finally agreed and when I saw the surgeon who was at the time um one of the surgeons that works with the Toronto Maple Leafs our hockey team here so you know pretty pretty good guy of course he's like wow do you mind if we, uh, I have some students here today and we don't see knees this bad this often. Do you mind if I, if I let them look at you? And I was like, oh, okay, of course. Um, anyways, so got all that fixed and the, the, it was a pretty big surgery. Like there's only one doctor here in Ontario, which is our province that even does the, the surgery that I needed. And along with that, I was unable to walk. As I mentioned before, I couldn't even put my leg down, couldn't even bend my knee for for the most part as every couple of weeks i was allowed to get a few more degrees of range of motion and then so i had to eventually kind of relearn how to walk like i still very vividly remember the first time i put my foot on the ground after that and it was like pins and needles shooting all up my leg and it was just a very weird feeling as my knee was essentially realigned in the surgery they graphic warning they kind of had to cut off part of the bone and realign where my knee sits so it's a pretty major thing Anyway, so having to relearn how to how to walk and you know, the biomechanics of my whole knee and hip and ankle and everything had changed with that. Um, and then just rebuilding up all that strength, as you can imagine, without putting my foot down or using my leg for so long, I had so much atrophy. Like my quad was probably the size of my forearm, and, <laughs> which is which is like not very good. <laughs> and uh, and so I had to rebuild all that up again, be able to run, be able to jump and sprint and squat and like do all of the things. And, um, and so I take a lot of pride in being able to do that. And I know what it's like to have that taken away from me. And of course it wasn't permanent or anything like that, but I I've experienced not being able to walk on my own and do stuff on my own. And so I never want that to ever happen again to myself and for, for anybody else within our control as much as possible.
Right, and then I just want to harp on that. You weren't able to fucking walk for like a half a year almost, right? Four months? Yeah, so yeah, just 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 shy of four months. It was like 13 weeks exactly to like put some weight through my foot and then it was like another couple months of crutches and you know assisted walking kind of thing and then yeah so it was it was the better part of six months until i was able to actually just walk normally and you know be confident to take myself somewhere and go do things by myself like there's one story that i've I've posted about for sure maybe a couple times even but there was uh one moment where i had to go to the washroom and i was at home and we had like brought my bed down into the living room and all this stuff and I couldn't really move around by myself. And so imagine being like a 20 year old boy who is a, a former or was an athlete and all these things. So I, I pride myself on like being able to do stuff by myself. I don't want to have to rely on people and all these things, you know, big macho, lots of ego, tough guy kind of, kind of deal. And I'm sitting there like asking my mom to help me like go to the bathroom. <laughs> and like, that was like, that's it. It was like so heartbreaking at the moment. And that was like when it really clicked for me, it's like, okay, this can like, obviously this is a surgery and whatever, it's going to get better. And, and, and you know, it, this is not a life sentence kind of thing, but this can never happen again. I can never let something like this happen again, as much as it's within my control, whether it be joint replacements or, uh, arthritis or just back pain due to inactivity or any of these kind of things. I need to be in control of my own health and fitness and, ability to move and so that's how i kind of model my life really after that and then through that through the not being able to move right this is something i love on your website by the way daniel am i saying it right yours yours mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay the first one yours yeah okay Either. i love on your website go if you go to my story on his website it lays it out so well though but with the pictures too i love that man <laughs> like yeah <laughs> after you got better it was like a nice smiling picture at a concert or something like that i love that one but right before that like you showed what happens from you, how your activity level took a plummet like how it affected your body composition like you got a lot of unwanted body fat kind of looked like um a good word would be bloated right you looked bloated just a little bunch of un uh, unwanted accumulated body fat right and I think yeah. a lot of people have like look like that right now just from not caring about their training, not caring about their nutrition, right? That's a lot of people's starting photos or worse, right? And by worse, I mean a lot more body fat than you had in that picture and a lot less atrophied muscle underneath, right? So what what do you think that taught you being um, going from, I think you already kind of said it, but going from super fit, uh, high-level athlete to be looking like uh, like a normal everyday person, with a bunch of unwanted body fat. What do you think that taught you going to what you it, look like now, right? It, it gave me a little bit more of a real sense of what other people go through. And now keep in mind, I was also like quite young at the time and I was still in school. And so I wasn't, I was obviously involved and interested in health and fitness and stuff, but I wasn't doing this professionally. So I wasn't really coaching anyone aside from like maybe a couple buddies or like, you know, whatever. Um, but that was the first time in my life where I had ever gained any excess or unwanted body fat. And of course I wasn't moving at all. And, and I didn't really, I knew that obviously if you eat more, you're going to, and don't move, you're going to gain yeah. weight, of course. But so I didn't overeat while I was like, well, I didn't, I didn't intentionally overeat and like gorge right. my, my feelings and food and all this stuff. And I tried to just eat normally. I didn't really pay all that much attention to it. I kind of accepted the fact that like, yeah, I'm probably going to gain a little bit of fat here and like, and, and that's okay. And and it didn't really cross my mind that I wouldn't be able to lose it or anything like that because I knew enough at that time to know that, okay, this is possible and that this is not, again, a life sentence and something that is going to be well within my control. I will get better. I will be able to walk again. It was never, there was never a chance that I wasn't going to be able to walk again. So, yeah, so, so it taught me a little bit more of a, of a real sense of the world. Like, okay, people don't, not everyone grows up being a high level athlete and not ever having to worry about what they eat. The other part of that was at the time of that surgery, I was no longer playing sports actively or like competitively, I'd, you know, play with my, with my buddies here and there, but not, not for real. And so it's really easy to stay in shape when you're 15, 16 years old, your body's changing and growing so fast and you can basically eat, you know, whatever you want if you're playing sports and it's never a thought that really crosses your mind unless you do not play sports and do massively overeat, but it was body composition was never, ever something that crossed my mind really until that time. And so I realized, okay, this is like, this is what people go through. Not everyone plays sports and not everyone has been 
I guess, as lucky as me to grow up having played sports and not having to worry about this. So let's see what we can do. And that's when I started to research a little bit more about diet protocols and nutrition and, and these kind of things and and to get the weight off. Now, I didn't do anything that special that I can say, oh, I, you know, Ted, I, I here's a secret for you. Like, I, yeah. I figured it out. Like, no, I started exercising again within the capacity of, you know, what my knee was able to do. And that obviously expanded over time. And uh, just started cleaning up my diet. I, I tried, you know, low carb, no carb, fasting. I tried all the things and all of them worked to various degrees. And I wouldn't regret doing any of them because I learned how those work and how those make you feel and why people find those different types of diets um, helpful. And I took what I what I thought was good or what worked for me from those things and kind of threw away the stuff that I didn't like. And then I've gotten to the way that I eat now. And that's, I'm wearing a Bruce Lee t-shirt today. And it's like, you know, his quote, I, I'll butcher the exact quote, but it's like, take what is useful, discard what is useless and, and add in what's uniquely your own. And so that goes for, obviously it was in the context of martial arts, but of course it goes in with nutrition and training protocols as well. There's no one size fits all everything. All of the things kind of work, but what works for you is only something that you can figure out. Right. And would you say that like helped you um, gain the desire to want to help people change their lives too, is when you got to that point? Is that when yeah. you decided to go to school for personal training? No, I was already in kinesiology oh, okay. school. So so I would have been in second, second or third year of undergrad at that time. Um, I didn't want to necessarily be, quote unquote, just a personal trainer at that time. And that was definitely <laughs> okay. like an ego thing that I really struggled with. Um, and so I went to chiropractic school, actually. I knew that I wanted to help oh, people. Right. I knew that I wanted to like be in this be in the space of health and fitness. Of course, I thought I initially that I kind of wanted to be more on the rehab side, having been in and out of clinics so many times, dealing with my own knee, ankle, whatever injuries. And I said, okay, this would be a great thing to do. This is what introduced me to all of uh, this entire field of becoming interested in human anatomy and biomechanics and physiology and all these things. So let's give back to that. Then turns out in school, the Cairo thing wasn't really for me, which is like a whole other separate discussion on like academia and other things. But, right. um, but then, then after that, I, I actually really struggled for, for a little bit for the better part of a year as to like, okay, what's my, like, what do I do? What is my identity? Sure. I'm still training, still working out, still training some people here and there kind of thing. But then I, I struggled with this, the ego of it again, of like, hey, I don't want to be just a trainer. Like that's not, you know, people look down on that. Anyone can just get, take a weekend course and be a trainer right, and all these right. kind of things. And and that's, that's certainly true. Like that hasn't changed and, it, and that yeah. still bugs me to, to some extent. Um, but what I realized is I can be on the front lines of this. The best way to avoid or the best weight loss strategy is to never having is to never gain weight in the first place. So if I can get in front of this, as far as the weight loss, as far as the injuries, like it's much easier to not have to heal a knee injury and just keep your knees healthy if they're already healthy. If you've already torn your ACL, dislocated your knee, whatever, have osteoarthritis, need a knee replacement, if all those things have already happened, well, it's much harder to to deal with. It doesn't make it impossible, obviously, but we'd rather not have that. So if I can be ahead of that and be on more of the preventative side of things instead of waiting for people to get injured and then come see me, then I thought that would be a good way to, to frame it for myself. And I'm not saying that chiros, physios, athletic therapists, whatever, are not can't be on the prevention side of it. They are just typically the way that people interact with that job is they wait until they get injured and then go see their athletic therapist or their chiro or physical therapist. And people might view a trainer and just being able to say, uh, and share information freely online and whatever I can get a, I can get a little bit of ahead of that. Right. So you're saying like the best way to treat like an injury is to just not get injured, but also to train that muscle, continue training. Right. If you can take care of yourself the best, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I think maybe if I misworded it to say that not the best way to treat it, because obviously you're not treating it, but yeah. the most ideal thing is to never gain weight and never gain excess weight and never get injured. That is the most ideal, like, you know, biomechanical way to live or whatever. But uh, obviously that's, that doesn't happen for everyone and not every single person in the world is going to listen to this podcast and like yeah. see the stuff that we post online and then that's okay. But ideally, that's what that's what is happening. We're preventing these things from happening. There will be catastrophe. There's going to be athletic injuries. You're going to go skiing and fall and take a tumble. And like, yeah, your ACL might snap and, and that sucks. But we don't 
you want to do everything you can to make that not happen in the first place. And that's not to say that you should be going through life thinking about, oh, I'm doing all this stuff so I shouldn't get injured. It's more to say that you should be doing, you should be training and taking care of your nutrition, all these things so that you can continue to do the things that you want to do for the rest of your life. Even when you're 90, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to go for a hike. Yeah, maybe you're not making it to the Olympics when you're 90, but you shouldn't be able to not go for a walk with your grandkids or play on the ground with your grandkids or, you know, these kind of things. And that's far away for a lot of people. Probably, I assume, Ted, you don't have a, an audience of 90-year-olds mostly. No, but, no. <laughs> but for everyone listening, like, that is that is going to happen. We're all going to age. Look at your parents, your grandparents, your, your teachers, and all of these things, and, like, look at the things that they start to do. And do they struggle to bend down and tie their shoes? To put their jacket on, Do they? is it hard for them to, you know, reach their whole body around and stretch their arms out? Like, these little things, they start to – it seems like nothing. But then it adds up over time and it gets, you know, progressively worse. And then it's like, oh, you know, grandpa just sits in his chair and doesn't do anything all day. So you want to avoid that as much as possible. And, and the way to do that is to continue to use your body and train properly and stay healthy. That's a great tip, man. I think, yeah, most people struggle. Like, yeah, my audience is mainly like 18 to 35 year olds. I've checked my analytics. It doesn't hmm. after that, it's like <laughs> half a percent. But yeah, um, I think a good thing is like, Think about those grandparents that you have if you're lucky enough to still have grandparents. Like I have um, one grandma right now. She has arthritis in her hands and she tells me every day she plays piano for like one or two hours and that helps to like reduce the pain. Like using her body helps to reduce the pain. And then my other grandpa, like he, he we, I live like 30 minutes away from him so whenever he needs help, like I'll go do yard work for him or whatever. But he struggles to ask me for help. Like he'll just do it himself. And he's 82 years old, man. I think that's insane. And he goes golfing on the weekends. And then I, I, they won't listen to this, but I have other grandparents, one who's dead and the other one who's like, you could tell they're old just by looking at them. You know what I mean? And it's they have completely different lifestyles. And I think that uh, like same diet wise, they're eating the same things almost. But and same body composition wise, too. None of them have excess body fat. They do. They're they are a little bit overweight, but their lifestyles are completely different. One is sed sedentary. The others are moving every single day, walking around, getting exercise in. And I think that helps a ton. So absolutely. Yeah, it definitely it definitely makes a huge difference, and I've seen the same thing with my grandparents. You know, the arthritis yeah. in their in the hands and wrists or knees, or uh, two of my grandparents have had knee replacements. And this is actually a good you know case study of it. So my one grandmother and then my one grandfather on the other side have both had a knee replacement. My grandmother kind of like very much took to all the rehab stuff and like listened to the, the therapist and like did all the exercises and like did all the things. And like she was like up on her feet very quickly, moving around, feels amazing now or never has any issues with her knee. My grandfather on the other side, stubborn man, very intelligent man, but stubborn and didn't really do the things, even though he would say to me, you know, I feel good when I do it. Then he feels good when I do the exercises. I'll say, okay, but then do them. And he said, ah, but it's hard. It hurts. And you know, the old, old stubborn man style. And, and now he still struggles with it a little bit. And that's not, again, their diets are more or less the same. They're not drastically, neither of them are eating like crazy unhealthy or super differently than, than the other. But that lack of movement has, has shown exactly what it does. And it's, yeah. if you, if you don't use it, you lose it, unfortunately. And that's, so you gotta, you gotta, but this stuff starts now. It's not, we're all going to decline at some point it's 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 inevitable so the way to prevent it is not to make the decline not happen but it's to slow the rate of decline if you're if, if you're watching on the video you can see like if you're here somewhere then that's fine and you're going to decline but if you can get yourself up here a little bit higher and so you have more room to work with until you lose the ability to be independent to bathe yourself to close your clothe yourself to cook for yourself and all these kind of things if you can get yourself started up at a higher point then you're going to save yourself a lot of grief down the road and ask anybody who's older who's who trains or who works out and ted i'm sure you've got clients as well that are that are older it's like all of them say i wish i started this when i was younger i know it's like expensive and this yeah. and time commitment but like i wish i started this when i was younger every single one of them says that you know what i find a lot too is when i start working with a client not always but I mean, um, some of them might not admit this to me, but some of them admit to me that they were they didn't want to reach out and ask for help. Like they felt um, like they yeah. didn't want to be that person that needed help, that wanted to ask for help. And I find that so weird, right? I don't know. Like you don't want to ask is, for it help. It is very you don't strange. Wanna... Yeah, it's weird. It's very strange, and I think it's like you know we live in a world that we as trainers are 
we're trying our job is to like do things to offset the world we we live in a world where we sit down a lot and we have so much access to so many processed foods and so many you know things that are bad for us and abundance of food and lack of necessity of exercise on a day-to-day -day basis other other than seeking it like the concept of having to go to a gym is kind of weird if you really think about it like we shouldn't as humans this never existed 500 years ago or a thousand years ago people just lived their life and they were active and healthy and whatever and maybe people trained to be athletes in the olympics or whatever it was at the time but like the average person didn't need to train just to feel better that wasn't a thing that that existed in the world right. so our job is trying to offset all of that and to av having to ask for help shouldn't be a thing but we're not taught how to eat well in school really we're not taught how to exercise and use our body we're taught a lot of a lot of silly things in school well a lot of good yeah. things as well but that is not really one of them and so it's the the analogy i use is like imagine you had to fix your own car well you might go to a mechanic most likely to repair your vehicle so you don't have any shame in not knowing how to fix your vehicle so why would why would someone have shame in asking someone for help with their diet and nutrition it seems like a very innate human thing to do and it is but due to the environment of the world that we live in it's not really that intuitive so we do we, you know most of us do have to ask out ask for help and seek help and on the internet or wherever locally but you know it's not you shouldn't be shamed to ask for help yeah absolutely man it's definitely weird yeah <laughs> that's that's a good anal uh, analogy you made uh like your car breaks down everybody just goes to the mechanic i do it too but like we all know those car guys that don't but yeah so if you don't like go learn it yourself there's no there's no shortage sort shortage of information on the internet you could learn everything yourself within probably a week of doing it every single day but most people don't have that free time i guess so if you are struggling reach out for help find someone that you trust or that you like their content you like their teaching style and ask for help yeah right and and in same same with like you can look up how to re repair your car online you can look up yep. how to do your taxes online like you can uh, freely you can find information freely available for for everything and the same is true with health and fitness obviously like this podcast is is freely available to everyone to listen to and so you don't have to necessarily pay for it but you do have to invest your own time in it and so you yeah. do have to there has to be some interest in you seeking out this information and the things that that we know as trainers they're not rocket science we don't hold some some secret you know knowledge yeah. that we we keep to ourselves behind like a paywall and like i'll only tell you this when you pay me like no the, the the paying is for the individualization of everything but the the grand lessons and the over the overarching themes of everything is is all the same like eat less and run more some people kind of shit on that and like oh that's oversimplified and it obviously is oversimplified, but that is what you need to do to lose weight is eat less and move your body more. How to actually do that and set up your life to be able to do that is that's the complicated part. But essentially what's happening or what needs to happen is is just that. Yeah, man, there was a huge article that just shit on what you just said. And I totally agree with you that they, they t took this whole article where they said, oh, their doctors told them to eat less and move more. They're fat phobic. And it was in USA Today. And I made a whole video about it. I was like, bro, what? This is good information. You are eating too much and sitting on your ass too much. You're doing nothing and over consuming. You're, obviously, you're going to get obese. And then they, this person in the article, they lost like 200 pounds and then got weight loss surgery and then regained all of the weight because they didn't work on any of the fucking habits. So they just tried to solve it with a magic pill. Like we've talked about that several times on this podcast alone. There is no magic pill. There is no quick fix. You got to yeah. change the underlying habits, that the behavior, everything. And that's and that's the hardest part, right? That's why saying like eat less, run more is is what needs to happen. But it's not necessarily helpful advice. Everybody knows yeah. that. As far as like the fat phobia thing, like I think, I mean that again. I know it's a separate conversation. I don't yeah. know if you want to get into that, but like it's a little bit ridiculous. Like being overweight is not is not healthy. Like besides the all the other stuff, like it's not healthy. Like you should love yourself and want to improve yourself at the same time there's nothing wrong with that and like those two things are not independent of each other but yeah the, the trouble does come with like yes that is good advice but or it's not good it's good information but it's not good advice to actually help someone you've got to work with those people to actually understand well why are they unable to control their diet or control their exercise or what's what's happening in this person's life and how can i fix them or help them fix themselves 
and doctors don't always have the the training, but mostly doctors also don't have the time. I'm not sure how it really works where where, where you are, but I know here like doctors are booked up so so steadily and like so packed that they don't have the time to sit down and have like a 30, 45 minute hour conversation with a patient about actually making lifestyle changes. So their training is to prescribe medication and that's obviously useful and helpful for like the society, but their expertise is not in lifestyle and behavior change. That's where, you know, trainers and other health professionals kind of come into the mix and they just don't have the time. And so they resort to, I'll refer you to surgery. Here's this weight loss pill, or here's this prescription for something else. And, and, you know, out the door you go. So it's, it's a, it's a tough one to, to say, like a, if a doctor's telling you eat less and run more, like, yeah, it's, it's good, but it's not, how do I actually do that? That's, that's where, you know, trainers and people yeah. who do this for a living actually come into play. Let's talk about that. The fat phobia. So I have a whole theory on it. All right. So my whole theory <laughs> all right, is at least in America, it, what is it like? It, I don't know the exact number, but it's like 56, 57, 58% of America's obese. And then like 70% is overweight. So I think all these companies, all right, like they're putting all these fat people on the magazines and their ads. They're hiring all these fat uh, influencers that are like in, not fat. They're obese. They're huge. Right. And they're putting them on the beach. They're putting them in bikinis. They're taking photos. They're selling shit. I think they're just trying to sell to the masses. Right. Because the majority of America looks something like that. So they do it. That's why they do it. They start this whole movement and then they shame anybody who's against it. That's my theory. What about you? Yeah, it's a. I'm inclined to I'm inclined to believe that. Uh, unfortunately, it's like it seems like a good business move. Getting people to change their behavior is horribly difficult. <laughs> like yeah. it is very it is it is very difficult. So instead of like while while you might say that oh there, if there's so many obese people, then there is obviously a huge market for people who are trying to help these people lose weight. That would be great, and there is a big market for that. But people think they want to lose weight. They say that they want to lose weight, but then you tell them what they have to do, and they're like, mm, well, that's kind of hard. If it's just okay for me to be obese, if Gatorade says it and Calvin Klein says it and like whatever other brands say it, then I guess I'm okay. And, oh, look at her. She's obese, and look how beautiful yeah. she is, and look how, and look how empowered she says she is, and she feels amazing in her life. And it's like, great. You, you should, should feel beautiful, and you should, should love yourself and be empowered and have a high-paying job. You should have all those things, but, but also be healthy. This is the part where I don't understand how we're just ignoring the fact that it's unhealthy. It's, it's totally okay to be a fat person. Like, I'll still love you all the same, but be healthy for yourself, for, for your own self, for your own family, for everything else in your life. I don't know. It's, it's, it's such a crazy thing. And I, I think it's so wrong. And I think it's, I think it's really going to hurt a lot of people. I think it's doing way more harm than it is good. For sure, man. And I liked what you said about like, uh, the healthy part, right? right? I totally skipped over that part. They are telling other people, this is healthy. This is a healthy body. This is what health looks like. And that's absurd because people who are obese die way earlier than anyone who's not. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had I had this one professor in undergrad, and she did research in in some stuff, and it was about uh, people who are fat but fit, and so they compared like these groups of people, and and the 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 conclusion of the research was that people who are overweight but who also exercise are equally as healthy or have equal risk factors as someone who is thin but doesn't exercise, and it was oh. like okay. That's that's fine, except neither of those things is the ideal yeah. way to live. You should be a healthy body composition and also exercise. Like, why are we comparing it to the to also not a good group of people? Like, yeah, it's not just obesity that causes health issues. There is obviously a lot more to it, but you shouldn't strive to not exercise and just be thin either. You should strive to be of a healthy body composition and also be exercising because exercising is about so much more than weight loss. And this is where I think like a, a big piece of it is like the amount of calories you burn in, in a workout is, is not that much. And it's not moving the needle all that much on your weight loss, especially compared to different types of exercises, which is a little bit of separate conversation, strength training versus cardio versus hit classes versus spin class, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Just do whatever you like. But, what does matter is your overall daily activity, the number of steps that you're getting, and that should be way higher than it is for anyone. And if, and if you're, and if you think it's like 10,000 is not a magic number, it's, it's a, it's an easy one to say 10,000 steps a day. It sounds great, but maybe you can increase that even more, but you can, 
influence your weight so much more by controlling your intake, your diet, your nutrition. And so striving to be thin, but not exercise, like it's not, it's not the good, it's not a good target. Another one along with this is, I don't know if you, if you see these things or, or, you know, whatever, but a lot of people say, and this is from fitness people, they market themselves as like, lose weight with me and you can still like drink beer and eat pizza every day and enjoy <laughs> your favorite foods all the time. And it's like, yeah, like, okay, like, of course you could, but is that the goal? Is the goal to like still eat like an unsupervised child? Like, I don't think that that's really what we should be striving for. Like, yeah, you should have freedom in your life, but also people are already <laughs> drinking beer and eating pizza and not losing weight. So confirming for them that what they're doing is right, is, it just seems like a backwards message to me. I don't know. What do you think about that one? I love that that you brought that up, bro. I just had this client sign on with me about a month ago. His name is Mark. He told me the sole reason he signed up with me is because that I said I sounded like I wasn't bullshitting. Like, because a lot in my videos, I say, if you want to lose weight, stop drinking fucking alcohol. You're going to continue to gain weight. You're not going to lose any weight. You're going to continue to binge. After you eat, uh, have a couple of beers, you'll order a slice of pe- or a whole pizza and you eat the whole thing. Like, and he said yeah. the reason for me saying that he signed up for, with me because he thought I was no bullshit. So I think that people who are saying that they're trying to trick people, but like real logical people aren't going to, are they're going to see right through that, you know, because you can't just eat fucking pizza, ice cream and beer and lose weight and be healthy. Of course you can in moderation, but what's what that's looking like what the doctor's telling you, like, you know, that meme when you, the doctor asks you how many drinks you have per week and he's like, and you're like, uh, I don't know, seven. And he's like, okay, per week. And you're like, no, per night. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> Something yeah. like that, you know? Or it's like the doctor said only one glass of wine, but the glass is like a, you know, an entire yeah. <laughs> soup bowl. Like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Shit. It's like, yeah, you, like, it's like, sure, you could lose weight by con- and continue to eat pizza and drink beer and like eat ice cream and whatever. Like that is definitely possible. And like, we know that, but is that healthy? Is that like a good way to live? I, I don't, I don't think that that's, that's true. And maybe I'm wrong and I would love to be wrong. And we can all just eat McDonald's all the time. And like, but it doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be the right answer. And of course you should still include those things in moderation. It doesn't mean that you can never have a sip of alcohol again and never have a cheeseburger again and never have a, an ice cream cone. Of course, have those things like enjoy all the amazing things that like we've created in this life. But not every day and not every second of every day, not every meal that if you really want to lose weight, there has to be some sacrifices because if you don't change what you're doing then nothing is going to change. And the point of you reaching out to a coach is to, is to like, is to want to change something. Otherwise like, why why are you reaching out to a coach for it? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, you, you said, uh, track your intake. So you have your clients tracking calories, right? Most of them. Yeah. Very loosely. There's very few clients that I have who, who I actually have them, like diligently track their calories. What I typically do is have people create a food log, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And just like upfront, it's just like, okay, write down everything you eat and drink in a week. Give me the rough amount. I don't need you to weigh anything, but like one bowl or one piece of like, just give me the rough amounts and, and then let's figure it out. And then from there I try and have them, we sit down and, or, you know, over online or if it's in person, whatever, and we'll look at it and be like, okay, what do you think we can change about this or what would you be willing to fix about this and more often than not there is something in there it's like oh yeah i didn't realize that i have like four cookies every night or a a little bag of chips or something every night maybe i could just have half of that or maybe i could remove that and it's like okay great let's start there see what happens and then we start to make changes as we go now i'm I'm so big on the training side of things that like i I focus way more on the training than the nutrition because i think nutrition is like is painfully simple for most people and it's mostly about making these lifestyle adjustments. The people who I have track their calories closely are people who are a little bit more experienced and who have like a little bit more specific goals. But for 90% of my clients, they're paying attention to their food and they're tracking their food and loosely like kind of like tracking their protein and stuff like that. But they're more making lifestyle changes and then things kind of balance themselves out. And if they're really eating super quote unquote clean and like, you know, with some treats and stuff in, in moderation, and the needle's still not moving on their weight loss, then we'll start to start to track the calories and start to like get a little bit more into the nitty gritty. But I'm really, I, I want to avoid the having junk food and, oh, if it still fits my macros, then I can still have it. Because people are starting to, people look at the number of the calories or the, or the amount of the macros before the nutrition value of the food. And I don't want to separate those two things. So I don't want people to get in the trap of, 
And of course, there's no one right way to do it. This is just the way that I do it. But there's no uh, the I don't want people to get in the trap of like, oh, well, I had that I had that pizza and that still fit my macro. So like I'm, I'm still good. I'm eating healthy rather than if they just had a piece of chicken and like uh, some Brussels sprouts or something. OK, so you're like more of like uh, building a strong plate in each meal, something like that, right? Yeah. 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 Just okay. making healthy choices and, and moderating the amount of food, of course. So you shouldn't overeat using hunger cues as a thing, you know, eat till you're eat till you're satisfied, not until you're full. You shouldn't be stuffed full at every at every meal. And more often than not, when you remove most of the crap, then weight loss starts to happen and you increase exercise, you increase step count through the day and all these things, weight loss starts to occur. When that slows, then of course things need to adjust. But up front, I, I rarely have clients track their macros and calories. How, how do you do it? Yeah, I have them track, or not macros, just calories and protein. But the reason I ask is because we yeah. were talking about like over over generalizations earlier and um, like how uh, someone wanting to lose fat will go to their doctor, right? And the doctor will be like, yeah, uh, you'll see your doctor for like 15 minutes after seeing the nurse for 30 minutes, or whatever, right? And they won't really help you with their nutrition. But something they will go seek out and find is like a dietitian, right? But again, this is going to be an overgeneralization, but I've seen so much content on Instagram and TikTok of um, dietitians saying like, yeah, tracking your calories is not going to help, all this shit. And I was just like, why as a dietitian are you going to tell someone that like tracking their calories isn't going to help? That's 100% going to fucking help you lose weight for sure. So I don't know. That's just something I want to talk about. No, yeah, definitely, definitely, I agree, and and it's it, it's hard to make those blanket statements. Like even myself, there are some clients who right out of the gate, I will have them track their calories, and this is where the individual approach comes into play. Some people yeah. that the the tracking of the calories is so cumbersome and it's like so overwhelming to them that it's like okay, if we start doing that, like that is too many things all at once, and so that's actually going to be worse for them than than doing it in a different approach. But some people are a little bit more experienced. Maybe they've done it before. Maybe they've heard of it before, and so they bring it up to me like. Hey, should I be, how do I track my calories? And it's like, okay, well, if you're willing to do it, here are the things how, like, here's how to do it. Here's what it's going to cost as far as like your time to, to be able to do this. And then let's do it and let's roll with it. Because I think that most of it is bringing awareness to all of these things. And so tracking your calories makes you very aware of the food that you're putting in your mouth. And that Absolutely. goes a really long way. Yeah, for sure. So, so many people once... are, are unconsciously eating. Yeah. 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 I, fi- I find myself doing that sometimes too. You know, you go put on like um right now i'm watching game of thrones every week with my girlfriend put it on maybe like go make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich that's like my that's like my treat or like uh grab some nuts man holy shit people that eat nuts without tracking those on a food scale that's an easy 600 calories 700 800 calories little like mason jar like a fucking one cup mason jar you fill that up with nuts that's a thousand calories gone yeah yeah so that's where like the education around food and yeah. nutrition kind of comes into play more, right? Because, of course, like you would, most people would classify that like nuts are a healthy food, assuming you're not allergic to them. They, they <laughs> are a healthy food for you to consume. But if you're eating like a thousand calories of nuts unconsciously, then like, yeah, you're, it's going to be really hard to lose weight. So this is where like, yeah, you can still eat healthy and not lose weight and that and there's food, total food amount comes into play. But this is where if I had a client who's like, okay, I'm eating all these things and like, oh, I see that you have like, these nuts every single day and your weight is not moving like how many nuts are you having it's like oh well you know they're healthy so i i had just i don't know i have like the bowl in front of me and i just like keep keep eating it's like okay now we've got to have some understanding of like the the, the calories of those and, and the total amount and but these are easy fixes it's easy right. it's easy to fix that rather than getting rid of the habit of drinking pop every single meal or ordering mcdonald's five times a week or whatever right eating out that's a huge one man do you, a lot of clients that come to you that's something they do a lot that you have to fix right away, them eating out a lot and not making the meals. Yeah, and it's a it's a difficult one because usually people who, in my experience, people who eat out very often, they claim that it's because they don't have enough time, time or yeah. they don't know how to cook or, or some combination of the two things. And and that's fine. So what I typically do with them is like, well, let's let's – try and make better choices if you're ordering out then like uber eats also has healthy restaurants on there as well like there's not just you know like mcdonald's and burger king and like whatever like junk fast food places like you can get not healthy you can get not junk food ordered to you every day or another thing that i've really come around to in the last probably like six months or so is these meal delivery companies where you 
pay like a weekly subscription kind of thing and they deliver you all the meals in like frozen containers and then you just heat them up and it's like okay then that solves your time issue but at least you're eating not fast food every 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 time and or every meal and so that's something that i've really kind of come around to and i and i use that a lot with with clients who kind of struggle with um eating out too often is just again bringing awareness to the choices that you're making you can still meal prep and order all your food by using one of these meal delivery services or at least just planning out what you're going to order instead of opening the uber app and choosing like the thing that's going to be there fastest or the thing that has a two for one deal or whatever it is that day like think about okay today i'm going to get uh you know a salad and chicken and some rice from this restaurant and then tomorrow i'm going to order like salmon and a baked potato or whatever from this restaurant and like you can still order things and not eat junk food. So it's again, bringing awareness to those things and, and just making better choices. Yeah. Those food delivery services are amazing. If you have the money for it, I would do that every fucking day. Yeah. And some of them are, they're actually not as expensive as like, as they seem. I, really? I'm, I'm honestly confused as to how they make money, but some oh, of them, wow. some of them work out to like $15 a meal kind of thing. And if you're ordering out, you're you're spending at least that on a meal, anyways. Yeah. So it, it's really not. I, I have no idea again how they make money at that at that price. But I mean, that's not that's not my my problem. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but but they're they're not overwhelmingly expensive if someone is already buying uh, multiple meals per week out. All right, Dan. Well, we're 46 minutes in, so I'm gonna start. Quick break from the show to talk about our sponsor of the show, which is Transparent Labs. And I work with them for two main reasons. They're third-party tested, so all of the stuff that's on the ingredient label is third-party tested, then made visible to you on their website. And I don't care about this, but they put um, no artificial dyes, sweeteners, or preservatives in their stuff. I don't really care about that, but a lot of people do, so that's another reason I'm working with them. And lastly, no prop blends. So a lot of companies don't do third-party testing, but also they use prop blends, which means they can put a bunch of bullshit in their product to inflate the real stuff that's in there. So if you're looking for a science back supplement company to buy from, Transparent Labs, code TED to save. Let's get back the show doing this last question you're my first guest that i'm gonna ask but i'm just gonna just for fun to end the conversation yeah. like um what is your belief system that helps you in life is it religion or a certain philosophy or something else what helps you interesting yeah um it's hard to say that it's i, I wouldn't say that it's religion although like i, I am you know, baptized and whatever. My family is somewhat religious and whatnot. I wouldn't say it's that, but it's more of like a, just through my own learned experiences, um, where I've, I've come to learn a couple of lessons that moving forward is all like taking one step forward in a positive direction every single day is a very, very important thing. And I know that that sounds so simple and like, okay, it's, you know, cliche guy, I get it. But to me, that's like been internalized, uh, through some experiences that I've had that as well as sharing what I know. So all of the experiences, all of the life things that have happened to me in my life have led me to this point. And I want to give that back to the world and to, and spread that as much as I can and spread as much positivity if I, as I can, if I can leave the world a better place than I leave, than I, than I got here. If I can leave some type of positive legacy when, when I'm gone in, you know, whatever, 80 years, then 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 I've done good. And so what can I do every day to try and push that forward? And I think that's I, like I've not really thought about this to put it into words, so I'm kind of thinking as I'm as I'm speaking. Of course, of but course. but 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 that is um that that is more or less like the philosophy that I that I lead my life by. And and that may very well change. Again, like I'm only twenty eight years old, so like I've got a lot more a lot more life to live and that will very well change as I, you know, get married and have children and whatever eventually. But um yeah, for now, that's that's more or less kind of the, the philosophy that I that I choose to lead my life by. And and one other thing is that there's a lot of stuff that we can control, but there's way more stuff that we can't control. So if you can control it, then there's not really much to worry about because you can do something about it. So so do that. And if you can't do something about it, then let it go because you can't do anything about it. And just make the best of the situation that you've or you know make the best of the hand that you've been dealt, kind of thing. So. Try not to be too emotional about things that happen. Understand what can I control about this. If I can do something, then go ahead and do that thing, and you're good. Nothing to worry about, but do that thing. If you can't do anything about it, then uh, then just let it go and, and kind of stoically make your way through that way. That I was just about to say, are you into stoicism? 
A little bit. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. am. I think I take, you know, take things from from different from different places, but uh, stoicism is definitely one of them. Yeah, yeah, I could tell. Control, you can control, yeah. make yourself better, make society better. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing on that, like, I, I know I, I don't, uh, my appearance doesn't, doesn't show this, but my heritage and like my dad's family is Greek. My mom's family is Italian. And so and no one ever guessed that. I get it. I, I you know, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> but, um, you know, those two cultures historically, like ancient Greece and ancient Rome, like these were two of the, the, the greatest civilizations that existed in, in the ancient world. Right. And they shaped a lot of the way, especially in the West, that like our world is today. And so I, I take that like v- very, very much to heart. The place in Greece where my grandparents are from is very close to where Alexander the Great was born and, and, and the place that he was from. And so I take this like quite, quite seriously. And so I think about like, well, my, my, if I imagine, if I let myself imagine that my lineage is, is to that, well, then how do I continue that? How do I continue that in the modern world? And how do I like continue to make the world a better place? People talk about Alexander as we're talking about him right now. How do people leave such a positive impact in the world that they talk about me and the things that I've done and how, how I can change the, the landscape of the world long after I'm gone. And so if that's through health and fitness, then that's through health and fitness. And I, I'm, you know, I'm not going about to go and conquer foreign lands and, and, you know, do that kind of stuff. But like, if I can positively impact the world through like helping people live a better life through controlling their body and, and taking control of their health, then, uh, then that's great for me. That's awesome, man. That, that was a really fucking amazing answer to that question. That was like a five Thank minute you. answer. I love that. <laughs> I, I I definitely can tend to tend to ramble as well as, as you know, <laughs> have, having a podcast as well. You you get real comfortable talking, <laughs> so maybe it's maybe it's too much. But uh, yeah, man, that was a great question. All right, Dan, tell the people where they can find you. Instagram probably the best place uh, at Daniel Yoris at Daniel Yoris on all uh, social media platforms. DanielYoris dot com and um, the Daniel Yoris podcast is uh, is the name of my podcast as well. And, uh, yeah, if you just Google my name, you'll, you'll find all the places, uh, very creative with the naming of everything, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's Y O R E S go to his website too, and read my story. Such a cool story. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you, Ted. That's uh, that's a, that's a, I very much appreciate the, the shout out and, and you reading that, that <laughs> section of the website, but, uh, yeah, it's awesome, man. Thank you. All right, man. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate you. All right. I'll talk to you soon, bro. Yeah.